Hello and welcome to Sparta Reexamined Episode 2, where we cover the Spartan Mirage, which was coined by Francois Allier in the 1930s, which essentially covers the commonly uh, misconceptualized widespread idea of what Sparta was. So I'm joined by Paul Bardinius and Patrick Molher, who you met in the last episode, who are going to talk uh, quite in depth about this whole sort of uh, mirage and how it came about and the sort of origins of uh, why, why it happened, basically. Why did Sparta have this mirage? Okay, so Paul, where do we sort of get this mirage from and, and what really is it? Well, going back to the, the beginning of the historical look at Sparta. So we go back to our earlier sources, Tertius. Uh, obviously, he was essentially writing propaganda for Spartans. And then as we go through time, we get Herodotus, who was writing at a time when Sparta was perceived as a counter to uh, Athenian aggression, for instance, by a lot of people. So he was writing with a, a certain eye to Sparta. Then we have uh, Thucydides, who actually lost a battle and you know, this changed his life to Brasidas of Sparta. And he tends to lionize the Spartans because of that. And if you lose a battle to somebody or lose a sports game to another team, you want to make them look as good as possible. So you see some of that in his writing. And um, then through the rest of the Athenians, uh, Plato and um, Socrates, there was a big push to look at Sparta as a model for the aristocrats at Athens. So certain aspects of Sparta become emphasized because they would be good for aristocrats and certain other aspects are either ridiculed or downplayed. And then finally, amongst the classic scholars, you get to Xenophon and Xenophon knew Spartans fairly well. He was um, sort of a guest friend at Sparta and he had a relationship with one of the Spartan kings, Agesilios, and he was writing for an Athenian audience about Spartans that he knew. So it's hard to say exactly when he becomes a booster for Sparta. Uh, sometimes he's a little too familiar with them and it seems like he is uh, involved in political intrigue at the time, so he becomes a little untrustworthy. But all of these men have agendas of their own, and that comes through in their histories. And so that's when you're looking at these guys, the biggest thing to note is that pretty much none of them are Spartans. I mean, Tertius was, but Tertius was really more of a poet, and most of his works are just lost. We have fragments here and there, but most of our knowledge of Spartan society and structure really comes from two main sources. I mean, we get a little bit from Herodotus, but most of it comes from Xenophon in his work, Constitution of the Spartans or Polity of the Spartans. And then our other biggest source is Plutarch, who wrote Life of Lycurgus, which he wrote a lot of lives. Like he wrote Li Life of Solon. He wrote Life of Theseus. He wrote about all these other legendary founders. But when he wrote about Life of Lycurgus, there's kind of like the first third of it is a bit of a bio. And then the entire middle of it is... And here is the society he set up. And then the last third is, and here's how his life ended. Yeah. And I mentioned last video, one of the problems with Plutarch is that a lot of his histories come from an author named Philarchus. And Philarchus was actually famous for telling sensational histories. Uh, he was derided by Polybius as being too sensational. He recorded the history of the resurgence of Sparta in the third century. The reformer kings, Aegis IV, and Cleomenes the third and what this did is it threw into the mix of Spartan history almost something that was made of whole cloth they were just resurging Sparta at the time and and it's unclear how much of it's actually a carryover from older classical Sparta and how much is just made up at the time amongst the problems is that Cleomenes hired a Stoic philosopher named Spheris from um, Crimea to advise him on how to rebuild all of these Spartan traditions. Right, and I think that's one thing that's really important when we talk about Sparta is obviously all of these polis, all these city-states were quite separate from one another, but the Spartans were particularly separate and often actually almost described as, a, as an outsider to, from the rest of the Greeks, from mm -hmm. their lifestyle, their, even their um, bodily statues, like they, they tended to be bigger and taller and so like that than the other Greeks because of their, their different in diet. So I think lots of the, um, we like to lump lots of the Greeks together, uh, which is, poses issues, but especially linking the Spartans to other Greeks, they were 
um, particularly different and, and described as different as well. Because of the fact that the Spartiates were essentially all aristocrats, because they had the Periokoi and the Helots as the other castes in their society, essentially, in order to provide them with a living, we see things like, well, they were taller, but were they taller than aristocrats in other cities who had access to more meat, for instance? And we see, well, they they spent a lot of time hunting and, and uh, this was a training for war, but you know, so did aristocrats of other cities. So if you look at the average you know, Athenian who might be um, a fishmonger and you compare him to a Spartiate, there's going to be a big difference. But if you compare the lifestyle of the aristocrats of any city to the lifestyle of a Spartiate, it may not be that different. And I think the other thing is a lot of this just gets exaggerated specifically because a lot of these authors were writing with the express purpose of using Sparta as a contrast. If you actually compare their very detailed political systems and things like that, they actually mostly parallel a lot of other Greek societies. And we can get into the weeds of that later in a different episode, but they're really not as different as everyone makes them out to be. It's just that these authors who wrote about them were specifically trying to make them sound different. You know, Xenophon was originally an Athenian. He was a student of Socrates. And because Socrates wasn't popular, Xenophon also got ostracized. And so Xenophon has a particular reason to maybe have a grudge with the Athenians. Plato was also a student of Socrates. He was known to be more fond of the Spartans. Aristotle was a little bit later, so he lived through kind of the demise of Sparta, or the demise of classical Sparta, and so he writes a little more critically of it because he witnessed where the system came apart. But all of these people are writing with something in mind to say, hey, here is why Sparta is contrasted, and usually almost always contrasted with Athens, just because at that point in time, the two of them were opponents. But for most of their history, they I mean, Sparta and Athens actually probably fought as many wars on the same side as on opposites. But it's just one of the most well-documented points in ancient Greek history was this massive rivalry and war between them. So that's why everyone writes about them as mortal enemies today. Absolutely. And I think, again, talking about like time periods, time periods are really important when we talk about... Um, any historical civilization, but of course, Sparta wasn't one static city-state, right? Just the same way if you look at America now and America in the 1960s, you see a lot of change, and that's a relatively small period of time. So Sparta in the 6th century oh, yeah. was very different to Sparta in the 4th century. And I think sometimes we like to sort of say, well, Sparta was this, as opposed to, I think Sparta was many things as it changed and adapted, just like any civilization yeah. is today and any other civilization in the past. So it's possible... Uh, which I'm sure we'll probably cover in another video, yeah. the whole Helot uh, sort of discussion, that lots of these theories put forward and lots of these suggestions were true at certain times in Spartan history, um, but changed as Sparta changed as well. So it's sort yeah. of inter interesting to see, again, as you say, lots of these authors that write in the sort of um, Spartan-Athenian rivalry era do compare them quite a lot. I would say the other thing about that, I'm really glad you brought up is the fact that it changes over time. Every single one of these authors references the laws of Lycurgus, and we'll get into Lycurgus in a different episode. He's something else. But everything, every one of these authors references the laws of Lycurgus as if they are one static set of rules. This is how it always was and always will be, when in reality we know for a fact they changed over time. And by their very nature, it was an unwritten constitution that was passed down verbally. And we have plenty of uh, evidence that it was different at different points in time. But none of the ancient authors treat it like it was. I actually have a story or a comparison that shows this pretty well. And that is Xenophon tells a story about the upbringing of boys, where the boys had this contest where they had to run and steal cheeses from the altar of Artemis Orthia. And other boys defended the altar with whips so you can see how this is this fits right into the you know spartan upbringing some kind of a contest this agonistic contest the whole thing changes by the roman period it probably changed at the time of cleomenes revival of sparta 
there no longer are there boys stealing cheeses from the altar and other boys whipping them. Boys are just essentially tied to a post and whipped. And it becomes this endurance contest to see how long you can be whipped. So you can see how this weird mirage that you talked about is formed. And you go from a contest of boys to, to a, you know, a show, essentially, like a weird yeah. sadomasochistic show for Roman uh, visitors. We also see that being um, projected in modern media, like in 300, the lashing until he's cried out is the one that's shown because it's sort of a more powerful symbolic element of this right. is how we beat boys yeah. into men as opposed to the wrestling for cheese in the Temple of Artemis is a little bit less, uh, less like that. So we sort of see these... Like, yeah. again, ancient sort of um, mirages being portrayed into the modern period as well because we sort of replicate the more exciting or more unusual sort of aspect that we hear of as well. Yeah. Can and you I'm imagine quite... Zack Snyder showing them, like, <laughs> running away with wheels of Parmesan while getting ripped? I mean, it's not <laughs> I mean, I'm actually glad you brought that one up, though, because I actually had here, and this is, I think, probably the most singular most important line of Plutarch in his entire life of Lycurgus. The boys make such a serious matter of their stealing that one of them, as the story goes, was carrying concealed under his cloak a young fox for which he had stolen, suffered the animal to tear out his bowels with its teeth and claws, and died rather than his theft be been detected. And even this story gains credence from what their youths now endure, many of whom I have seen expiring under the lash at the altar of Artemis Orthia. And the reason that that line is absolutely critical is, remember, we said Plutarch lived 500 years later in Roman Sparta. Plutarch mentions that he went to Sparta and witnessed their practices. And throughout Life of Lycurgus, he often references ancient sources. Like, he'll say, oh, Aristotle said this, and Philarchus said that. But a lot of the times, he just lists off these everyday practices with no source whatsoever. And the fact that he physically went to Sparta and witnessed their practices means that in a lot of cases where he gives a very detailed description and cites nothing we can reasonably infer that it's something he witnessed himself. And if he witnessed it, then it was not a classical practice. It was a practice of Sparta as a Roman tourist state 500 years later. Yeah, I think that's part of the problem, too. A lot of the later authors just assumed that the stasis was what it was. I mean, this is what Sparta always did because they're doing yeah. it now. You look at things like, uh, you know, Sparta's um, lack of art, for instance, for a lot of later writers, but then you compare that to the vases we have from Naucratis in in uh, Egypt, where Spartan art was at at the you know forefront of the art of the day. It was beautiful art. So, as again, the the, the caution from the beginning of this episode that we have to take into account what time period of Sparta we're talking about is always in effect. And I guess if we want to roll with that, um, I mean, Plutarch is 500 years later, but people did not stop writing in the Roman era. Yeah. Uh, we eventually get to much more recent authors who uh, had their own interesting takes. And the thing is, a lot of them, particularly in like kind of the later Renaissance and the early uh, Victorian era, throughout the 16, 17, 1800s, a lot of people used... Plutarch as the gold standard for ancient historians because he lived later and he compared what all the other historians said and did a bit of historiography work himself. Everyone used him as the gold standard. But particularly in the case of Sparta, what it means is that a lot of a lot of the knowledge of classical Sparta has been polluted with knowledge of Hellenistic Sparta and knowledge of Roman Sparta. And so we have entire centuries of scholarship that are built off of faulty assumptions that what Plutarch said always was true and always would be is throughout any point in Sparta's history. And you know, as a, as a bridge to where I know we want to end this episode on the modern problem of Sparta being either lionized by right-wing elements or demonized by left-wing elements, the Enlightened, Enlightenment philosopher Rousseau, uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, uh, 17, early 1700s, he, um, he wrote, essentially, uh, he looked at Sparta as a model for both 
what would become proto-nationalist and proto-socialist. So he saw in Sparta a community wherein uh, private property was not, you know, as important as being able to share horses and dogs and even wives. And then, you know, he saw also that this um, highly unified, um, very ritualized society that was homogenous was something that he compared to their own like Parisian society at the time where there was lots of factionalism. Ironically, if you actually read the history, there's so much factionalism in Sparta, it's not even funny. But he looked at that and, you know, if you're comparing it to Athens, it looks like a stable society. So this is funny because this is the heart of the modern discussion. You have 300, which ushers in this, you know, um, fetishization of Sparta as the, the ultimate right-wing paradise. And then you have a, a reaction to it that essentially demonizes Sparta as fascist. I mean, to call Sparta fascist is insane, honestly. But this is what happens yeah. in the modern context. Well, specifically back to Rousseau, Rousseau was, among other things, a political philosopher. And one of the philosophies he really helped develop was the idea of, quote unquote, the common will. Hmm. So the idea that the nation, the people, there, there is a common interest of society and society should try to base policy around that common interest that everyone shares and the roots of fascism and the roots of socialism both borrow from that idea and what now whether you deify quote unquote the state or deify quote unquote the people is different directions you can take the common will but he had this idea of the common will of society. And I mean, to a certain extent, democracy is about trying to get, okay, well, what do the most people agree with? So well, every been... every modern political philosophy is influenced by him. And it's when you look back at, he looks back at his romanticized picture of the Spartans, where it's all about, you know, sacrifice for the nation and, you know, uh, separate were, were okay, but together were invincible. He looks back and romanticizes that and says, this is the society. And so then all these future political philosophers developing out their philosophies refer back to Rousseau, referring back to the Spartans. Well, this is this is the example of why you really can't look backwards and put these modern philosophical schools back onto the Spartans, because the Spartans in ways were proto-socialists. The Spartans were in ways you know, obviously proto-modern nationalists, right? The Spartans are are definitely uh, the beginnings of democracy in Greece. So you're looking at all these different things that are coming together in this sort of primordial form. And yeah, you can make anything you want out of that if you carry it to its uh, later uh, uh, developments. And depending to what extent you romanticize their society, you can romanticize right. it in any direction and try to align it with any of them. Right. And, and you know, that we see all sorts of other modern things being put back on the Spartans. So, for instance, yeah. I have arguments all the time because I I believe that the more proper term for helots is serfs, not slaves. Now, there's a lot of work been done that you know shows that you could privately own helots, but that's the case in in many serf societies as well. Yeah, that's. I mean, I think the biggest issue people have is that they think. Or they, they are, well, serfdom is a way to make the helots sound less negative and more positive. And really, there's no point in history where being a serf is a yeah. positive thing. Yeah, but no, it's, uh, it's a semanticism that people want to fight today. In fact, interestingly, Rousseau compared them to the serfs in Poland during his day. And obviously, we obviously compare them to Russian serfs a lot because that's yeah. pretty much as bad as serfs get. Russian and surf. that's if, if you're getting into history, the historiography, there's what people call the second serfdom, which was Eastern European serfdom, which was very different from Western European serfdom yeah. and a lot worse. So and that's who Rousseau compared the lots to. So let's let's just talk about the, the state of historiography now. So the modern yeah. scholars, this is this is a problem I see in the modern scholars is that they are broken into two camps. And the two camps are, they fall down completely along modern political lines. So you have those who watched the movie 300 and decided that that was a recipe for how to fight um, battles in the Middle East. And it became a bizarre nationalistic thing for all sorts of different strata in America to put 
uh, Greek helmets on their guns and uh, Molan Lave on their, you know, uh, helmets and stuff. And then on the other side, you have a push to denigrate Sparta as a means of denigrating those people who are lionizing Sparta. And we see that play out, like, for instance, 300, of course, is the example of, uh, you know, the biggest booster of Sparta as superheroes, because that's what they are. And then there was a, uh, a comic that was a counter to that called Three, which was also wildly incorrect. I mean, it's horrible. It's bad, bad history in that comic. But it was perceived as a counter. Right? And I'll tell you, I'll give you another example that, that it sort of annoys me, is that modern historians, for instance, like Stephen Hodkinson, fine historian, has written a lot of really good stuff on Sparta. But in some of his public appearances, he's essentially said that we need to portray Spartans as hapless military losers yeah. in order to, uh, you know, push them away from these people who fetishize them. And that's that's crazy. You can't. That's I, just as bad to change the history yeah. to get people out of fetishizing Sparta as it would be to change the history yeah. to fetishize Sparta. So what he basically said is, we can portray them as losers who were like North Koreans who were just all about war but really bad at it. But either way, whether you take these two complete opposite roles, you can encourage either of those as true because both of them are bad for the far right. And that's just, that's not a study of history. That is just political activism. And to have that from someone who is considered to be one of the leading modern historians is disappointing to say the least you're going to encourage people to believe two different things that are mutually exclusive and cannot both be true but as long as they both lead to the same political agenda they're both right that's not right yeah, and that's and that's really my problem with it because i i actually believe that the view of sparta is over militarized in in many mm -hmm. authors writings but to say that it should be done because it would break away the ultra right is is crazy to me. I mean, we see other authors like, uh, for instance, uh, my friend Mike Cole wrote *The Bronze Lie*, right? And in if you read his book, he's coming from a place where he wants to strip away that right wing, and you know we we differ, and I don't really believe that you know a tally of wins and losses means anything if you don't go into when you win and when you lose. But at least I know it's coming from a point where he wants to create an accurate vision of Sparta, not a fake vision of Sparta. Whereas you compare that to like, um, what's it called? Oh, Brett Devereaux. Brett Devereaux. Whole, I, ha I have yeah. his quote too. Yeah, he I know wrote he, a, uh, he's, a, he's on your he list wrote, there. Yeah. And I just he wanted to say that yeah. somewhere in there he mentions that um, his, his views really are basically political. And once again, it's... There you go. I didn't encourage the most accurate or up-to-date scholarship on Sparta. I just looked through the last 50 years and found all the things that made Sparta sound bad and put them together in one essay, and then it got half a million views. Yeah, so I guess, sort of, just reference back to the Mirage here, it sort of originates from ancient sources, sort of, but even the Spartans, to an extent, sort of built their own Mirage back in their own time. Um, but otherwise, it sort of yeah. got built upon by later period sources, um, and now we've sort of flipped upon the modern age where we're trying to almost build a counter argument not to actually discover the truth about history but to to sort of poke at the other political side that we disagree with which quite frankly is quite a petty thing to do when it comes to uh, a historical group of people to try and essentially say we're going to use you to attack our modern political enemies. Um, so sort of we can see how the mirage sort of takes place from, from ancient sources to building them as something that they're not, but also how we're almost building a second mirage in the modern age, which is also portraying them as something which they were not. And of course, neither of them is right, and two wrongs don't make a right, and instead we need to sort of take the modern politics again, which is a common theme in this series, take the modern politics out of Sparta, and try and look at the Spartans for what they were, the good and the bad, and everything else in between that, to really try and understand who were the Spartans, you can't counter a mirage by baking another mirage, because then all you're doing is spreading false information, uh, whichever you look. That's I said, the, the core of our motivation for wanting to do this, obviously we have our own biases, but our goal is to do the opposite of what these people are doing. It's not to portray Sparta in a different light than they're doing, but just fundamentally, if their goal is to recast Sparta to suit an agenda. Our goal is to recast Sparta 
to suit the most accurate and up-to-date scholarship. We're not picking and choosing our scholarship to advance an agenda. We are analyzing the scholarship to try to find truth. And, and fundamentally, that's, that's needed because if you create a counter mirage, all you're doing is giving ammunition to the next mirage, right? So if you're, if you're painting a picture which can be easily proven to be false, like as Spartans, obviously we're not hapless military losers, you know, you just give ammunition for the, the next round to work against you, right? So coming to a more realistic understanding of what the Spartans were, right? They were a bunch of aristocrats. Are they militarized? There's, you know, they're, they're militarized in the way that all aristocratic elements in ancient Greek societies are militarized, right? There are many ways to look at this and understand Sparta as standing out in some ways, but well within sort of the, the Venn diagram of uh, what the aristocrats of other nations were like, other polis.